Okay. So I want to talk a bit more about utilitarianism. And, and I want to talk about the places the theory leads some people and what it might tell us about both utilitarianism and certain approaches to applying the theory. You know, in the article, in the New Yorker article I had you guys read, you might have noticed that we get from Peter Singer's very down-to-earth concern about starving children to guys like that Nick Bostrom fella, you know, fretting about whether our glorious future where our descendants' consciousnesses are in space stations around all the stars and our light cone will happen, right? And to be honest, I find Bostrom's speculations more than a bit absurd, right? He doesn't, but, you know, this this just seems like... I won't say the sci-fi I read as a kid. You know, I read a lot of Asimov and guys like that. And there are a lot better sci-fi writers than Nick Bostrom is. But this just does seem like science fiction to me. And I just wonder, to me at least, why grown people are taking this so seriously, right? But I do think if you think about applying utilitarianism in a certain way, you're going to end up with these conclusions. Now, whether that means we should all be worried about killer AI, you know, killer robots in the way that McCaskill and Bostrom and Ord and these people are, or whether that means that we should either discard utilitarianism or think about a different way to apply the theory, that's an open question. For me, at least, just to lay my cards on the table, I think that the kind of stuff you see at least long-termist effective altruists like McCaskill and Bostrom saying are just so outlandish that they indicate a problem with the way they're applying the theory. But the way they're applying it gets back to the ways that utilitarians deal with uncertainty about the future, and I think this opens up a major problem for the theory that I'm going to keep pushing on in the next few lectures. Okay, so there's an objection that I have in mind here, and I think, at least for me, effective altruism is a pretty, at least it's long-termist variety, you know, many denominations in this church of effective altruism, the long-termist one is just one of them, there are others, but at least the long-termist approach to effective altruism, I think, shows how expected utility theory gives crazy answers, and a lot of utilitarians are going to use expected utility theory. Well, problem here, though, is what in the world is expected utility theory? This goes back to what I said about thinking about the chances of something happening and building that into your sort of little utilitarian calculation. To see what it is, let's take a step back. Let's imagine that I offer you a bet, right? We'll start with gambling. I promise this will come back to utilitarianism. I'll flip a coin, and you can pick in the air heads or tails. If the coin comes up the way you say, you win 10 bucks. If, you, if it doesn't, you lose, and I keep whatever you paid me to play the game. Now, what's the most you should pay to play this game. What is a good or a fair price? You know, what's the most you should pay me for this gamble? Now, a lot of you guys, I'm going to guess, will come up with the intuitive answer here, but I want you to think about the logic of that answer. Ever so slightly harder one, I'll roll a die. If it's a six, you win 12 bucks. You, know, you can imagine I'm com maybe I'm being completely fair with this. And if you've ever seen craps tables, they have these little bumpers so people can't control the roll when it hits the bumper at completely random. Or you could just imagine that you maybe not a six, you pick the number as it's rolling, right? You win 12 bucks. If it comes up your number, if it doesn't, I keep whatever you paid me to play. What's the most you should pay for this gamble? What's it worth? What is... In other words, the expected payoff. Well, you just do the math here, right? 
And for all that, like, the expected altruist types and utilitarians like to flaunt, you know, that they're supposedly good at math and those of us who aren't utilitarians aren't, the math is really, really pretty simple. You know, you have a one-half chance of winning $10. $10 times one-half or $10 divided by two is five. One-sixth of winning 12. 12 times one-sixth or 12 divided by six equals two bucks, right? So that's probably the expected answer that a lot of you guys gave, you know. And, you know, you can think a bit more about the logic why here. Imagine that you and I played either of these games for a long time. If I charged you more than $5, if we played long enough, you would eventually lose money and you would keep losing money in the long term. You know, let's say you paid me 6 to play. Even if you won the first two tosses, you know, you might be 20 bucks up. If we play long enough, you are going to start to lose money because the odds are not in your favor. In the same way with the die one, you know, look, you only have a one in six chance of winning. If you paid less than two bucks, you know, if you paid like a dollar, you know, I might win four or five dice roll, die rolls. That's not all that unlikely because you only have a one in six chance of winning but if you play long enough roll it enough times whenever you win you're going to get 12 that'll even out and more than even out your losses you will start to make money all right so this basic idea is what's behind expected utility theory you know but instead of money and dollars and cents, you plug in pleasure and pain. You know, you don't you don't necessarily need to like think of like some exact measure. Utilitarians will sometimes talk about hedons or utils or whatever. You know, you don't need to do that. But just the idea is, you know, you think about the possible costs and payoffs for each action. And you think about both the size of the payoff and the odds that it might happen. And the idea here is, even if something is really unlikely to happen, if the payoff is big enough, it's worth doing. You know, you might think that anything you do now is only going to have a very small impact on the future. It's going to be unlikely to make a big difference. But, you know... If you are Nick Bostrom and you think that robots might kill us, but if robots don't kill us, our ancestors, trillions and trillions of them, are going to have their consciousnesses in space stations around stars, well, that's trillions of people all experiencing happiness, even if whatever it is only makes a slight difference in that happening, because you have trillions and trillions, such a big payoff, Bostrom will say it's worth doing. You know, you can get more down to earth with this, right? You know, the expected utility, they'll say, you know, you can imagine I could either give money and 100% save one person's life. You know, imagine Singer. His example, you know, let me say I can get 50 bucks, save one person's life, or, I don't know, you know, fill this in as you want, I could give 50 bucks and I have a 1 in 100 chance of saving 10,000 people's lives. Well, if you are a good expected utility theorist, you would say that the second is better because even though it's unlikely, the payoff is greater, right? You don't need to, but do the math yourself. It'll work out. Not good at math, but I'm not that bad. I had to do it in my head. I'm like, wait, am I, am I right? I'm like, yeah, I'm right. You know, it's the same as rolling the die, right? It's not all that likely you win, but the payout if you win is pretty big. So, you know, there are a lot of cases where you should take the gamble on rolling the one die at least according to expected value or expected utility theory. 
And utilitarians need to say something like this because they need to deal with the fact that we're uncertain about consequences and all we can ever know are probabilities. And once you start thinking in terms of expected utility theory, it's going to be very hard to resist going down the road that guys like McCaskill go down into effective altruism. Now the problem here though is, this seems to make some problems for utilitarianism worse. I don't think people really note this, but it's worth noting, right? You know, look, let me give you guys, you know, think about the Ursula Le Guin, um, those who walk away from Amelis, right? You know, she says, well, imagine this entire city, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people, their happiness depends on the suffering of one small child. And now look, a lot of us already have some problems with this, right? You know, every now and then, I don't know if they're just trying to irritate me or they really do think this way. You know, I'll have a student who's just like, yeah, what's the problem? Torture the kid. And I don't know what to say to these people except, good God, I hope you're not going into, say, medicine or law enforcement or heaven help us, you know, early childhood development, right? Um... But most of us are going to have some real problems with that. But expected utility theory makes that worse. You know, imagine, let's tweak Le Guin's example. Let's imagine that instead of definitely things will start to go to hell in the handbasket for our beautiful city if we stop torturing kids, that there's only a 1 in 1,000 chance it will. Nine... D 9.99% we don't need to torture kids anymore and things will be fine. The thing is, if you agree with expected utility theory, if you make the city big enough, they will say we should still go right on torturing children. Why? Let's imagine it's one of those huge New York or even Tokyo sized cities, you know, I think Tokyo's 15 million, right? Let's say 15 million people who are blissfully happy and maybe, we're not sure, we think probably not, but there's at least a one in a thousand chance that that all depends on torturing a kid. If we stop torturing the kid, the city goes to hell in a handbasket. Well, on the one hand, there's the fact that it's only one in a thousand. On the other, there's the side that it's 15 million divide by 1,000, multiply by 15 million, you're still going to end up with a big number. If you are a utilitarian who believes in expected utility theory, if you are like these effective altruists, you will say, yeah, okay, torture the kid. In fact, if we needed to torture more kids, there's an upper limit, but we should do it. hope you guys see the reasoning there, right? You know, the numbers aren't important. Plug them in whatever way you want. But the problem here is big numbers for bad effects, even for small probabilities, they will say it's justified. That starts to look really weird to most of us. Now, I, I think the utilitarian is just going to bite the bullet here. You know, guys like Bostrom certainly do. And, you know, I said one response utilitarians will say to things like, uh, you know, Le Guin's short story is they'll say, well, that's just a weird case. You know, that's, that's fantasy. The theory should only deal with real cases. Maybe, right? But when you're Nick Bostrom and you're telling me weird stories about space stations and Earth's light cone with simulated people, and you're telling me I ought to do something for the glorious simulated space station people future... I think you've lost all right to dismiss Ursula Le Guin's, like, story because it's a bit fanciful, right? Or any other examples like my modified one in a thousand omelas case, right? So, if, if you're Bostrom or McCaskill, given the moves you're making, I don't think you can say, don't worry about those cases, they're just weird, weird cases give us weird answers. Anyway, hopefully that makes sense to you guys what the problems are. 
Incidentally, if you guys are interested, there's a really good episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds that actually just picks up the Amelis case. Um, very clearly inspired by this Lagoon short story. Part of me is tempted, you know, at least with my in-person classes, to make them watch it instead of reading Le Guin. I actually think Strange New Worlds is, is actually really good. Quite like some Star Trek, right? Which I have strong opinions about. Um, you guys probably don't care about that, so I will not digress into my very strong opinions about Deep Space Nine and Star Trek The Next Generation. Moving right along. But just to warn you, you can expect a few Star Trek examples going forward. Just... Be ready. All right. Here is a bigger problem, even if you don't, you know, aren't worried about the weirdness of Bostrom's case or the results you might get. Is there any principled way to plug in the odds? You know, if you guys are kind of perceptive readers, you might have noticed in the New York article they talk about, you know, this guy Toby Ord, and Toby Ord says, well, you know, my credences are that there's a one in six chance humanity goes extinct in the next whatever, right? And you might read that and you might think, oh God, one in six, man, we're, we're in a bad way, right? But I want you to think about that word credence. What does that even mean, right? It sounds fancy. It sounds like, oh goodness, man. Toby has a credence. We're, we, well, well, one in six. Credence is just a fancy way of saying this is my guess about the odds, right? Before you go being too impressed with Toby Ward's credence of one in six, you know, you could pull any number out of the air and say you have a credence. So whatever, right? I could say Sam Duncan's credence that, that hum humanity will go extinct is 100. Or it's 99% that will go extinct, so there's no use fighting, so we ought to just do whatever we want, right? Now look, my point here is this. In and of itself, I have just as much justification for whatever number I pull out of the air as Toby Ord does. Now look, maybe, maybe Ord's done a lot of research, Maybe he has more justification for the number. But anytime someone tells you about chances, anytime someone tells you, well, I think the odds are X, Y, Z, whatever, you ought to really ask how they came up with that number. And the problem with expected utility theory, the problem with this way of applying utilitarianism, is I'm not sure that there's any principled way to plug in the odds. You know, look, this is not a problem you should overlook, right? You know, I have friends who are economists. I could write them year after year and say, do you think there'll be a recession next year? And most of them will not do a whole lot better than random chance and giving an answer. They'll do somewhat better, but not a lot. You know, I have friends who work in politics, who work in political science. You know, how good a prediction are they going to be able to give me about, this is going to date my lectures, so I guess I can't keep using them forever, but how good, a, you know, whether Joe Biden will win re-election. Even events a year or two out, most of us aren't great with coming up with numbers that we're super confident about, right? And if people start giving us overly precise numbers, then usually I think we should be very skeptical. You know, if, some, if you ask someone and they say, well, I think there's a 99.9% a .9 chance that Biden will win, You'd probably be skeptical. You'd probably think that they're not principled with those numbers. The same with 99.9% .9 the Republicans will win. You know, I have people, I know people who would give you those numbers, you know. But they're usually partisans. They're either hardcore Democrats or hardcore Republicans. Their credences, they got them, but... 
how much stock should you put in them, right? And I think this leads us to a problem. What we peg the credences at, the chances, I don't want to use this term, I, you know, I hate using big words to sound fancy when you, know, you shouldn't, but what we plug the odds at, what we think the chances are for events, are lots of times determined by our own commitments, our own views, right? I'm going to guess if you want to know, if you ask 10 smart Republicans what's the chances Biden will lose, you're going to get a very different number from them on average than if you ask 10 really smart Democrats, right? What each side wants to happen will play some role in what they think the odds are. You know, if you don't like politics, talk to somebody who's a fan of a sports team. I lived in Chicago for a while. People were obsessed, at least for some of my friends' work, knew people who were obsessed with the White Sox. And you talk to these people and be like, yeah, yeah. I'm not going to try to do the Chicago acts and whatever. I'm not great at it. But yeah, I, I think there's at least a 50% chance the Sox make the playoff this year, playoffs this year. And you'd look, and if you knew anything about baseball, like their starting lineup, their pitchers were bad, their one good hitter kept getting hurt, and it's like, there's not a snowball's chance and you know where that the White Sox make the World Series. But these people who are otherwise intelligent because they love the White Sox would put the odds way higher than anyone ought to. And I think this is a real worry with expected utility theory that due to our own preconceptions, we might peg the odds in ways we shouldn't. You know, and think about how this might work if you're like a Silicon Valley type or a guy who loves science fiction. You might peg the odds that killer robots are our biggest threat and not say nuclear war or whatever way higher than you should, not out of being sinister, but just because you spend a lot of time around AI or you really love robots, right? And robot stuff. But I want to come back to this because even if we don't go down the path of trying to like do math for everything, the consequences of actions are really, really hard to know in a, in a way that I don't think these guys face up to. And one thing we should say is even if you are not a, a long-termist, even if you're just a more down-to-earth utilitarian, if you look at Singer's article, it's not at all clear that giving to charities saves lives in the way he says it does. These people can quote you these really impressive sounding numbers. They can say, well, look, you know, $2.50 for a mosquito net, 50 bucks, 20 mosquito nets, 20 people who don't get malaria. The problem is we have no idea whether people are actually going to use these nets once we send them there. Some people probably will, some people won't, right? If you send 100, 100 mosquito nets and only one person uses them, you know, then the odds start to look way different, right? And there's some evidence this happens, right? Sometimes people use them as fishing nets. Sometimes people make clothes out of them. Sometimes people just don't sleep under them because it turns out to be a real pain in the ass to sleep under a mosquito net every night. Especially if your house is blazing hot, you got to put a mosquito net up in the bedroom. Maybe you want it if it's 100 degrees at night in your house because it's been taking heat all day. Maybe you want to go outside and sleep under the stars, right? I probably would too. Beyond that, though, there's an argument by this economist, Angus Deaton, who, who I respect a lot. He's got a really good book, Deaths of Despair, he and his wife, um, Anne Case, that I think everybody should listen to. It's just really good. But Deaton argues in this other book, The Great Escape, that Singer EAA-style charity is actually, in the long term, overall harmful. Countries that get a lot of charity, Deaton will say, end up worse off than the ones that don't. 
And you might say to Deaton, you know, you might say, well, okay, well, Angus Deaton, you know, I'm going to guess that if I looked at 10 people, 10 of them are in Norfolk General and 10 of them are just people on the street. There's a better chance that more, you know, one of the people in the one in 10 in Norfolk General is going to die in the next week than the one guy on the street, right? Sorry, Sentara, whatever they call it. You know, you might say, well, countries that get a lot of charity do worse because they're worse off to start with. Doesn't mean charity is ineffective. I think that is a pretty good reply, but Deaton will compare different countries, countries that have gotten aid versus countries that haven't. And he also gives a pretty plausible story. He says, you know, there's a limit generally to how incompetent and corrupt governments can be because if they get too incompetent or corrupt, people just quit paying taxes and they can't finance themselves. And he'll say a lot of times charities actually help bad, incompetent governments finance themselves. And this is one way that people in these countries end up worse off. There's all kinds of big, unexpected effects, too, from charity. I don't know that Deaton is right, right? He's a very smart man. He's very perceptive. He gives some interesting evidence. I don't know that he's right, though. I'm not an economist, and some economists disagree with him. But it's also not clear that he's wrong, either. Even someone like Singer needs to worry a lot more than he does about the consequences of the actions. You know, Singer just says, we send money to these impoverished countries. It's going to save lives. Great consequences. I don't know about that. It's not, it's not as obvious as Peter Singer makes it out to be. I will add, and I'm not going to wade into the politics of another country, though. I will add that it is very clear that Singer misrepresented what was happening in Bangladesh. He makes it out to be a famine. It was actually a civil war. And charity, if you look up the history of it, it would not have solved the civil war. And even Singer, he puts it in a footnote, but he admits, well, you know, it wasn't charity. It was India going to war and allowing the refugees to return home. But if you look at the situation, no amount of charity would have solved the problem. I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know if Singer just didn't do his homework here, if he's being willfully dishonest, willfully dishonest to a good end, but dishonest nonetheless. But either way, I think that's really damning, right? You know, the refugees didn't want food aid. They wanted to go home. It's not even clear there would have been an infrastructure to distribute aid. India didn't want them there long term. You know, a lot of Westerners opening up their wallet to Oxfam wouldn't have solved the Bangladeshi humanitarian crisis. And the singer says it would. Either he doesn't know the situation at all well and hasn't bothered to learn about it, or he's just not telling the truth to us. Either way, it's pretty damning to me. Anyway, so... That's a lot in this you know, lecture, what expected utility theory is, why utilitarians should be more worried about the consequences. I'll pick that up in next lecture and talk about some possible responses.